hello, I'm Ajay Banerjee from the Tribune's New Delhi Bureau. We are discussing a matter of very great importance. A person from Delhi has produced a series of 12 documentaries on the 1971 war. His name is Subrata Chattopadhyay, and he is the chairman of the Peninsula Studio out here. He also is part of the Brains Trust of India in association with the British High Commission, has done this work. Uh, Subrata, how difficult was it to produce these 12 documentaries which you have done on the 1971 war, and what message is in it? Uh, it was, uh, frankly speaking, the difficulty stemmed from the fact that we were completely unfamiliar with the history of the 1971 war. That is where I'd like to start. Because if you ask me, uh, there are two photographs which defined the 1971 war so far as I was concerned. One was a picture of General and later Field Marshal Manik Shaw sitting with Mrs. Gandhi. And the second was a photograph of the surrender ceremony in Ramna Racecourse in Dhaka on the 16th of December. Frankly speaking, beyond that, most people that I spoke to didn't know what exactly happened. And I'm speaking about a very large cross section of society, which is something which bothered me because I knew for a fact that this was perhaps one of the finest military victories anywhere in the world ever. And I'm making the statement after having been through last year and a half of some significant research. So the way it happened is that last five years, we have been producing a series called Brains Trust in association with the British High Commission in Delhi, which covers a very wide cross section of subjects. And it is bereft of any rhetoric, uh, any controversy. These are plain stories told nicely by people of eminence from both the UK and India. So in this journey, we have a whole bunch of stories, which are stories from the battlefield. And this we try and do and get narrated by officers who have actually fought the war. So in this journey, about two years back, we had three outstanding <coughs> officers who participated in this series. The first amongst them was Major General Ian Cardozo of 4-5 Gurkha Rifles. And he did three episodes. One was on the history of the Paramvir Chakra. The second was on bravery, where he covered the Battle of Atgram and the Battle of Zaki Ganj and the heli lift of the Gurkhas into Silhet. Uh, then we had General Satish Dambiar, who narrated his experience as uh, the 2IC of the first Marathas, who came down from Tura, which is a part of the 101 Com zone. And they fought a very bitter battle in Jamalpur. And then they link up with the two paras in Tangail and come to Dhaka. And the third was actually really nice because it was on the history, the maritime history of India narrated by our former naval chief, Admiral Arun Prakash. And while he was in the studio, I requested him that why doesn't he share his experience as a fighter pilot when he was on an exchange program uh, as a naval aviator with the Indian Air Force in the 1971 war. He was extremely diffident, a very humble man. He was very, very diffident about coming on but I persuaded him and he gave a short narrative as to what happened in the 1971 war. And he was attached to the 20 squadron. I have to say that I lived with these three narrations for a period of about a year and it kept bothering me that I couldn't join the dots. And that is where the, the, the search started. And I then spoke to these three officers and they were very kind and they directed me to a bunch of people who had fought the 1971 war. And that is where the journey started about a year and a half back. And I have to say that I just felt curious as an ordinary citizen that instead of, uh, you know, doing just one piece, why don't I look at what happened with the Indian Navy, the Indian Air Force and the Indian Army? That is how this journey started. And I have to say that in this journey, what ended up happening is that everybody gave me books to read. I checked it out on the public domain and it started coming together. So to give you a plain answer, it was an absolutely exhilarating experience. But for me, who was unfamiliar, it was a very, very uh, challenging and uh, exciting journey. Uh, so, Rato, your uh, documentaries, I've gone through some of them, talk about the famous heli lift across the Meghna River in the eastern flank of Bangladesh, now Bangladesh, then East Pakistan. It also talks about the tank battles spot on both flanks of Bangladesh. I'm first of all touching Bangladesh because that was the country formed then. So both flanks of Bangladesh, the west flank and the east flank. 
You also had this lovely narration by Lieutenant General Shamshed Singh Mehta, which talks about the overall just and unjust war. It shows where the Indian Army stood uh, for uh, for just behavior and not with the unjust behavior that the Pakistan Army was carrying out. Your experiences on talking about heli lift of Meghna, Bangladesh tank battles on the Eastern Front specifically, so Bhutan. Yeah. So uh, what happened is that as we uh, sort of got a better sense of what had happened, we said that let us stick to a particular area of the war. and we chose to focus on the area which is called the dhaka bowl and you know when we started reading the maps we found that dhaka is enveloped on two sides one side by the the ganga and the brahmaputra which becomes the padma and the other side is the river meghna now the rivers in bangladesh are are something which we need to understand because we are so far away from them bangladesh is a very pretty country it's a riverine country and therefore dhaka is between these two large rivers and therefore is impregnable because these rivers are at at places you know 16 to 17 miles wide so we decided that why don't we starting with general nambiar's uh, episode and they came in from tura which is inside the dhaka bowl we looked at the at, at three corps which operated in the 1971 war there was the two corps in krishnagar commanded by general raina It was 33 core by General Thapan, and there was the 101 Com Zone on the top. But we focused on the four core commanded by General Sagat Singh. Now, what had happened is that in 1971, the four core, which is headquartered in Tezpur, they shifted their headquarters to a place called Teliamuri, which in Bengali means Tel and Muri, in 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 just right next to Agartala, and that is where General Sagat came in. I think in September October. and he moved his core headquarters there and he had three divisions he had the 8 div in the north which was commanded by general krishna rao he had 57 div commanded by general ben gonzalves uh, which came in from agartala and then there was general rocky hira now to answer your question what happened is that the 8 div which was in and around silhet which was a very major place uh, general sagat had these uh, 10 or 12 helicopters which was attached to him under the for for res, uh, for 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 evacuation purposes and rescue purposes it was uh, called 110 helicopter unit out of silchar and they were these young pilots right and they loved sagat singh i mean i this narration is done by the youngest pilot of the 110 helicopter unit they really loved sagat singh and sagat singh got them to practice you know a little bit of night flying a little bit of heli lifting and so on but they really didn't know why he was getting him to do all that now the story as it it was a very fast moving battle you know i mean the 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 four core had got into behind enemy lines on the 1st or 2nd of december and they had already fought the battle of jalai but the war started on the 3rd of december evening so the 57 div uh, they fought a very fierce battle in ganga sagar and uh, akhoda which fell on the 5th now the officers who fought the war thought that they were actually going to kumela because sagat's remit was east of the meghna but what happens parallelly that is what is interesting about this series is that the 28th squadron there were 10 squadrons of indian air force which wanted to ground the indian air, uh, pakistan air force in bangladesh and there was only one squadron of the pakistan air force flying sabers in tezgaon and dhaka on the 4th they fought some bitter air battles but they, they i mean they they caused damage but the pakistan air force decided to sort of hunker in and they just stayed put inside the pens and hangars on the 5th so on the 6th the 28th squadron commanded by then wing commander later avis marshal bishnoi they decided to crater the runway so they didn't fight an air battle they just destroyed the runway on the 6th they carried out three sorties they damaged the runway they came back on the 7th and they damaged it yet again and in fact there's a wonderful conversation between wing commander vishnoy his boss uh, rook captain malan and the air vice marshal the sasso in uh, shillong uh, avm devashar they said that you know vishnoy you are you're mad i mean you're going to commit suicide what you're suggesting but they allowed these mix to carry out these operations after duly checking out the safety factors and they cratered the tezgaon runway on the 7th morning now imagine 7th morning they cratered the runway 7th afternoon 
Sagat carries out the heli lift from Kaila Shahar to and he heli lifts the Gurkhas into uh, Silet, uh, some 500-600 Gurkhas. This is happening on the seventh afternoon, having created the uh, uh, grounded the Pakistan Air Force on the seventh morning. So Sagat was very much on top of it. This is seven. Eighth also he carries out the heli lift into this thing. And ninth, you know what he does? He catches hold of Chandan Singh, who is the station commander of Jorhat. And he says, Chandan, now we'll leap over the Meghna. 16 miles wide at places. 16 miles wide. And his 311 brigade, which had come into Brahman Badia, Brahman Badia had fallen. The Pakistanis had retreated to the river bank. And uh, the Indian army fought a battle in Ashuganj. But while this battle was on, Sagat was crisscrossing the Meghna with his commanders trying to find landing site across the Meghna. In a, so they chose a place called Raipuram. And what happens is that on the ninth morning, the four guards who were in Ashuganj are asked to come back to Brahman Badia. They come to the football stadium in Brahman Badia. So what happens, Ajay, is that on the ninth morning, the four guards, commanded by uh, then Lieutenant Colonel Himmat Singh, they uh, are asked to come back to Brahman Badia and they tell the, uh, the, 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 the one of the companies commanded by uh, Major Chandrakant that you guys are going to go over the Meghna into Dhaka. Now, Major Chandrakant says that till that time, 9th, about 11, 11, 30 in the morning, they thought they were going to Kumila. And these uh, helicopters come in and uh, they are told that you will be heli lifted across the Meghna. And the first heli lift happens at around 4, 4.30 in the evening. And they take the four guards across. And that is how 6,011, if my memory serves me right, troops are heli lifted across the Meghna by these 10 and a few more helicopters, which had joined them from some other squadrons between the 9th and the 13th or 14th of December. The, the adversary just did not believe that Sagat would carry out such a audacious plan. And there is an interesting part to this, uh, Ajay, which is uh, when the uh, infantry was being moved across the Meghna, Sagat's staff officers hand them maps of the terrain across the Meghna right up to Dhaka. These maps were printed in the Survey of India press in Dehradun, which Sagat had got printed way back in October. So that raises this wonderful mystery that Sagat was very sure that there would be a plan B or a plan C or a plan D, and it might happen that Sagat will have to leap over the Meghna. So while the Indian army made this grand announcement, that Sagat has his remit is to clear east of the river Meghna. I firmly believe that there were a very small group of leaders who had a plan. They didn't know how the battle will go, but they had a plan that they will go for Dhaka. And when we get back to the west flank of East Pakistan, that is west flank of Bangladesh now, how do you see the battles out there? So I have to be honest with you that I am not at all familiar with what happened in 2 core and 33 core. I have just focused on the battles in the 4 core area. And this one battle in the 101 comm zone area, uh, Ajay, I, 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 I have not been able to focus on those battles, Ajay. Yeah, so we'll shift to the Western Front. You have done a lot of work. I saw those documentaries on the 20 squadron, the hunters, which were yeah. also Patan Court. Uh, could you tell us yeah, about that? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a fantastic story. And I, sh I, I decided to do that story because of two reasons. Uh, it started off with my interest about how a naval aviator got into this war. And this naval aviator being Admiral Arun Prakash. And uh, Admiral Prakash, uh, as I told you, was very diffident about telling his own story. He's a very humble man. But I sort of ferreted it out and discovered that his commanding officer was a legendary fighter pilot called Cecil Vivian Parker. And uh, at the time, Wing Commander Cecil Parker, he was commanding the 20 squadron, which are hunters. So they were based in Hinden. But what I'd like to point out here, uh, Ajay, is that uh, 20 squadron has got several features, which, which I'm sure is true about many Air Force squadron. But for those who see it, will see it as an example. They trained very hard. 
if you speak to the pilots who flew in the 20 squadron they called parker a martinet he was very very demanding of his pilots they used to train really hard they used to fly low fly fast uh, you know they they had to preserve uh, uh, they had to preserve uh, oil uh, uh, the fuel because they were flying pushing the aircrafts to its limit so their uh, their their targets were in places as far as peshawar kohat miyawali sakesar uh, from pathan court and they fought a very hard battle it was if i remember right it's one of the most highly decorated squadrons of the indian air force in 1971 war they lost two pilots they lost uh, uh, flying officer murli dharan and they lost squadron leader uh, jal mistri but they fought a fantastic battle and it's considered to be one of the finest performances in the indian air force in the western sector but what is really interesting is that the way they trained for their battle and if you hear that story they had you know they had gone to jogindranagar to see the refineries they had gone to bhakra to see the dam as to how best to manage these targets which i found very very interesting uh, Ajit. i'll keep it on the western front first the navy the bombing of karachi operated in python yeah. oh, uh, legendary 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 yeah. battle at karachi yeah so uh, i got interested in the navy for two reasons one is that as you are well aware that the navy in 1971 was a was the youngest of the three services right i mean Though it it the Indian Navy started off sometime in late 1940s, but it came into its own in early early 60s. We acquired the Vikrant in early 60s, right? And we had acquired these uh, you know missile boats, which were meant for coastal defense, and they had come to Calcutta, so they tugged it from Calcutta way to Bombay. But what is amazing is if you ask me, 1971 was the Navy's finest star, and the untold story of the 1971 war is the Indian Navy. I think it really came into its own. So what happens is that they take these missile boats, which have limited range. So they tow it, right? These Patiyas tow it, they bring it within range of Karachi and they let go these missile boats. And they caused havoc, uh, the Operation Trident and later the Operation Python. They, no one expected, it was, it was an innovation, which is one of a kind as it were. And they really kind of uh, caused havoc in Karachi uh, during those two operations. And uh, uh, they were both very successful. And Commander Yadav, as you know, <clears throat> got a Mahavir Chakra during that operation. So th those two naval, op those two, uh, as I keep repeating, those two very innovative uh, interventions, uh, you know, sort of saw the Navy <clears throat> deliver and how in the Western Front. We'll go to the East, Navy's Eastern functioning. The Vikrant, the role of the Vikrant, how the Seventh Fleet came into or threatened to come in, what the Russians did, what happened? Could you narrate to us? Yeah, yeah so yeah, here I would like to <clears throat> again mention that uh, uh, I came across, uh, uh, thanks to Admiral Prakash, uh, the officer who was the commanding officer of the 300 squadron of the Seahawks, which were the fighters off the deck of the Vikrant. And uh, this is Rear Admiral Santosh Gupta, who got a Mahavir Chakra, wonderful man. He lives in Bangalore and I went and met him there. So he told, later, he also later commanded the Vikrant and he got commissioned as a fighter pilot on the Vikrant in 1960s. So he had, you know, he had multiple assignments on the Vikrant. Vikrant is to me the most fascinating story in the 1971. What happened is this, that the Vikrant, firstly, the Indian Navy had decided that they are going to go all out in the 1971 war and perform as a strategic arm. You know, it won't. Because in 1965, they were not allowed to go north of Porbandar parallel, as they were called. In 1971, there were two or three problems. One is that the Pakistanis had a very significant submarine arm. And they had a, a, a submarine called INS PNS Ghazi, which was acquired from the Americans. And the Americans had called it Diablo, which means the devil. And the Ghazi was a formidable submarine. So the Ghazi was dispatched to sink the Vikrat, period. That was the only role the Ghazi had. And it was, a, it was something which the Indian Navy was worried about. The second was that the Vikrant had a problem with its boilers. So they had to cut down the speed of the Vikrant to 14 knots. Now at 14 knots, it's difficult to take, you know, fly an aircraft off the deck. So there's a whole story around that. 
and how the senior commanders of the Indian Navy decided that they will go to war with the Vikrant. So here is what they did. They fixed the Vikrant and they sent it off to Cochin. I don't remember when, but I think it was in July, June or July. Then from Cochin, it goes to Chennai. And then they fix the Vikrant, all its engineering issues. The aircraft start getting embarked, commanded by the, the Seahawks squadron was commanded by uh, and then Lieutenant Commander Gupta. And they start training their pilots and they, you know, they practice out of uh, the train out of Chennai and then they start moving on and they embark on the Vikrant. Now, then what happens is quite fascinating. The Vikrant vanishes. The Indian Navy hides the Vikrant. Nobody knows where the Vikrant is because they don't want anyone to find out where the Vikrant is so that it is not at a risk. I mean, you can hide a paper clip, you can hide a pen, you can hide a... And, you know, and I'll add, I, I will add for our viewers, 1971, this is a pre-satellite era, when probably a couple That's of countries right. had satellites and India and Pakistan did not have satellites. That's right. But to, to you know, the, 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 the commander-in-chief of the Eastern Fleet was a, an outstanding officer who we, we tend to forget, uh, Admiral Krishnan. He decided to hide the Vikram. I mean, this is, you know, when you tell someone, it's like telling a little child a story. So they hit the Vikrant. The Vikrant vanishes. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me pick it up from Ghazi. So the Ghazi is seduced into uh, coming to Vizag uh, by the Indian Navy. And that's a fascinating story how they do all sorts of things to convince the Ghazi that the Vikrant is in Vizag. And they use the INS Rajput as a decoy. And on the third night, the Rajput is asked to sail out of Vizag Harbor and somewhere outside the Vizag Harbor, if I recall right, she drops some charges and after a while, the Ghazi explodes. There's a huge under, under, underwater explosion and later the naval divers find that it is the Ghazi. And if you read Admiral Hiranandani's book, the Ghazi's hull had exploded inside out. So it had obviously exploded from within because of a bunch of uh, you know, factors which, which are there in the book. So the Indian Navy doesn't claim that it sunk the Ghazi. The Indian Navy claims that the Ghazi went down on its own. If you read Admiral Hiranandani's account on the history of Indian Navy, which is really, it's a very detailed version of how the Ghazi goes down. Now, the Ghazi goes down at about 12, uh, 15 in the morning because the clock in the Ghazi, which the divers retrieved, had stopped at 12, 15. So that's how they know that that's when the Ghazi went down. Of course, in addition to the fact that they heard the underwater explosion. So the Vikrant has sent a signal that the Ghazi has gone down and the Vikrant comes out. And at 10.30 in the morning, they carry out, the Seahawks carry out the first sortie. And that's the first time Indian Navy's aircraft carrier sees action. Indian Navy's aviation arm of the uh, fighter arm of the Indian Navy, the 300 squadron sees action. And they fly to Cox's Bazaar and bomb Cox's Bazaar at about 10.30 in the morning. And they fly really low, almost kissing the water. And they fly off their watch because there, are, there is no navigation, uh, watch and time. And that story is told by Admiral uh, Gupta. And they go, they bomb Cox's Bazaar and they come back. And later in the afternoon, they go and bomb Chittagong. Now, the, Gaz, the Vikrant then dominates this 18,000 square nautical miles of Bay of Bengal. And, you know, I think that the leadership at the time realized what an aircraft carrier and what, uh, uh, you know, an aviation arm of the Navy can actually do, the kind of damage it can do. And I think that should never be forgotten, the role of the Vikrant. And I have to add the Vikrant had other problems. You know, it lift got sh stuck. The, the lift which takes the aircrafts in and up and down into the, that got stuck while during the war. It's radar malfunction. But despite all this, it was commanded by an officer called Captain, later Vice Admiral uh, Prakash. And he was, he, he was considered to be, you know, a very fine officer. He kept everybody together and he got the whole thing going. So Vikrant in itself is a great story, Ajay. Okay, we will. Uh, I take one of the last questions. Uh, Subrata, how do you see? Uh, you have you are you told me once that you are not a military historian to be very specific. So how did you get into this? You have told us that you got thinking and you got met the admirals. After twelve making these twelve documentaries, do you think you can make more? And are you now partly a military historian? Uh, 
I think that's a good question. I will never claim to be a military historian. Like I will never claim to be a journalist because you know what you have, I don't have. What I think uh, is important is Ajay that we as citizens of India discuss a lot of very important issues without knowing the details. We we you know the headlines take us you know uh, to a different direction, and we we are unfair to ourselves because when you understand all this, we as citizens feel far more comfortable. The reason I say I'm not a historian is that military history requires a lot more rigor, a lot more peer group review. I have actually, if you ask me, what I have been able to do is uh, reach out to people who I think are credible. Uh, their stories are absolutely accurate. They don't speak about themselves. They speak about the war as it happened, and they give a very balanced view. If you notice, there is absolutely no rhetoric, no jingoism. There, there's no bashing of the adversary. In fact, all of them say that if you diminish the adversary in this battle, you're discounting the, uh, the, the performance of the Indian military. I mean, it was a formidable adversary in every single instance. You cannot, you know, sort of diminish the adversary because you're discounting the ability of the Indian military. And I think I was very fortunate that we had all these 12 or 13 officers speak uh, about what they had seen in the war. And I was very fortunate that at the end, completely by accident, Lieutenant General Mehta, he gave an absolutely masterful uh, sort of overview of the war as he saw it, uh, you know, as a young tank commander. And, uh, you know, the way he says it, he brings in a philosophical dimension of war, which is so important, you know. Uh, he talks about humanism over barbarism, democracy over military dictatorship, uh, maneuver over attrition, very powerful ideas he comes up with. And I, I, I would be, I'm so grateful to you that you reached out to me. And, you know, if these can be seen by many, many people, then people will know that war fighting is a very complex, uh, it's a very complex kind of uh, uh, process. You were talking about the, uh, the, of the U.S.'s enterprise earlier. Can you imagine how the Indian political leadership held its nerve and the Indian military leadership held its nerve in face of the U.S.'s enterprise? And Indians just went ahead. And then there's a, there is a wonderful episode by Ashok Mukherjee, who was a permanent representative of the UN. I requested Ashok to do a piece as to what was happening in the UN, right from the 4th of December till the 16th of December. The Indian diplomats were at it. Indian uh, the intelligence agency, Mr. Kao was at it. The head of IB was at it. The defense production was at it. The defense ministry was at it. It was a very large cast of absolutely outstanding men and women who, who, who just saw us through. And finally, this war was about liberating Bangladesh. It was not an India-Pakistan war. This war was, as, as, you know, as, as the most serious thinker says, it was about liberating Bangladesh and creating a new country. And the kind of goodwill the Indian military enjoyed, you know, you talk to a helicopter pilot, he says that I, 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 I sort of carried these huge, uh, uh, you know, guns, uh, artillery guns, and the moment I landed, the Mukti Bahaini boys and boys would come, the local villages would come, take it off quickly, right the way through, you know, the Bangladeshis, uh, the citizens, as well as the Mukti Bahaini, they fought together. Oh, it's time for us to end the show. The Subrota has been very nice and kind, and actually people who have not seen this documentary, the Brain Trust India has it on a YouTube channel. You can see they are very highly educational, they're highly recommended for school and college going children. I've seen a couple of them. They are very well made and tell the history as it should be told. Thank you for speaking to the Tribune, Subrata. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Have a nice day.